Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Megan Fall. I'm the Vice President of the Arkansas Audubon Society, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the first virtual meeting of the Arkansas Audubon Society. Um, Arkansas Audubon Society was founded in 1955 to conserve the natural resources of Arkansas with a focus on birds. Specifically, the society promotes research through our trust, conservation through our bird records and bird friendly yard initiative, and finally education through our youth ecology camps. Um, 2020 has been a, been a long strange year, but we hope that this meeting will be a highlight for you. Uh, time to fellowship with other birders, learn something new, or just wave hi to someone you haven't seen in a year. Uh, we also hope everyone had a good time this morning birding on their own. Uh, if anyone went someplace special, let us know in the in the chat box. And uh, later tonight, we'll announce the winners of the Arkansas Big Day competition that some of you participated in uh, by birding this morning. And we'll also go over the Society Trust Report and any uh, business we may have. But uh, first, we have an excellent presentation planned for you, uh, monotypic bird families of the world. Uh, monotypic bird families consist of true one-of-a-kind species and represent some of the weirdest, most interesting birds in the world. Examples of these families are the kagu, the huatzin, I hope I said that right, <laughs> uh, the shoebill, and uh, I'll let our, our speaker tell you the rest. Uh, our president, Samantha Scheinman, will now introduce our speaker for tonight's presentation. I am very pleased to introduce our special guest speaker, bird tour guide, Stefan Lorenz. Stefan was born in Germany, but moved to the United States at a young age and began birding in Texas. He completed a master's degree focusing on grassland birds, then joined various research projects in Australia, Jamaica, Costa Rica, and especially Alaska. Stefan also has a broad background in education, including teaching college level biology and working as a biologist educator for the National Audubon Society. He now leads tours for rock jumper birding tours and high lonesome bird tours. He has birded all over the world, from Alaska to Colombia to Papua New Guinea. I need to mention also that my husband Dan and I had the great pleasure of having Stefan as our bird tour guide in both Colombia and Honduras, where he showed us spectacular birds, including my personal favorite, the lovely Quatinga. So without further ado, please welcome Stefan. All right, thank you. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. I hope everybody had a great day birding today. I was not able to participate in Arkansas because I am in Iowa currently, wrong state. So, but uh, again, thank you, um, Dan and Samantha for inviting me. Thank you for the Arkansas Audubon Society for giving me this opportunity. And I would like to take you on a little bit of a journey around the world today. We'll be covering um, pretty much every continent except Antarctica while I'll introduce some of these monotypic bird families. So uh, right on the cover slide here, you can see one of the most iconic monotypic bird families, the famous Kagu of New Caledonia. And I'll talk about that species in more detail in just a minute here. So first of all, let's take a look. What, what is a monotypic family? So basically what that means is it's a bird family that has one sole single surviving species. So I put an ostrich here, common ostrich as an example. Uh, this is the family Struthionidae, and this used to be a monotypic family, but things change. We all know taxonomies are in flux, um, changes every year. You get the update usually in the late summer to the eBird. And this, um, os this uh, ostrich now has been split into two species, actually, common and Somali ostrich. So it's no longer a monotypic family, but at one point it was. It was basically the only member of that family. So here's a, um, there's a, only one of two phylogenies I have in here, but is a good example. These are, this is the super family for the waxwings. Has a whole bunch of bizarre lineages in it that I'll talk about more in detail. But if you look at the top branch there, the Elaturidae, this is one of the most recently recognized monotypic families. This bizarre little uh, spotted Elatura looks a little bit like a winter wren. 
uh, or um, used to be thought as a brain babbler, but uh, through new genetic research, uh, researchers found that this is completely unique and actually an ancient offshoot uh, related to wax wings. It's a bit unresolved still, but basically the point here is if you go to the very tip of that branch uh, where it says Alachura, in that genus, there's only one species, spotted Alachura, making this a monotypic family. So most of these monotypic families tend to be uh, pretty unique, uh, ancient lineages, and quite special, especially for family listers. But I do want to throw this one in here. Uh, again, this is not a monotypic family either, but I do want to throw this uh, rock fowl as an example. There are many families of birds that are very, very special and unique, but they tend to have more than one species. So in this case, there's a white-necked and a gray-necked rock fowl, but it's still a really, truly bizarre bird. But since I can't talk about every single bird family today, I had to limit myself. I chose a couple of examples of monotypics uh, based a little bit on what type of uh, photos I had of them. So here is the uh, really neat phylogeny of all the major bird groups around the planet. And I will basically uh, make a big circle around this. So it's quite complex. I won't touch on every single thing, but um, we'll be really jumping through the phyl phylogenetic tree of birds quite a bit and moving from one continent to the next. So it's going to be a, a world journey here. Um, for a, everybody that's interested in taxonomy, here's a bit of a comparison. Um, there are two major taxonomies. There's Clemens, which is what we mostly use in North America, and that's what eBird uses. And there's the IOC. This is what people use mostly in the old world, Europe, Africa, and so on. And um, Clemens recognizes a total of 38 monotypic families out of 248 families in total. And the IOC recognizes 37 out of 250 families in total. So roughly 15% of the bird families are thought of as monotypic. So just to give you some differences, uh, for example, Clemens considers the familiar osprey as monotypic, just one species, but the IOC actually splits it into two species, western and eastern osprey. Don't worry, that's not a difference between California, Florida, the uh, eastern osprey that's Australasian, that's um, nowhere near this part of the world. The IOC also does not recognize the crested shrike jay, really bizarre jay from peninsular Malaysia. It's black in plumage with a bit of white, it's got this weird straight up crest on its head. And Clemens now recognizes this as a ancient offshoot of the Corvids. So that's a new family for Clemens. But the IOC in turn recognizes the streaked scrub warbler, a little nondescript bird from North Africa and the Middle East. But these are the major differences. But if you look overall, there's a lot of consensus, uh, 38 versus 37 between the two taxonomies. So let's take a quick look how this breaks down worldwide. So in North America, we actually have 11 monotypic families, five of which are endemic to North America. Uh, quite a few of these come from the West Indies. There was a big reshuffling and reclassification of some of the birds there, and uh, that leads to many of these monotypic families. If you look at South America, um, not that many actually, nine monotypic families are present, and only three are endemic. Uh, one of the reasons for that is actually that some of the monotypic families spill over into Panama. If you look at Africa, uh, seven monotypic families with just four of them endemic. And the most monotypic families are not surprisingly found in Eurasia. It's got a huge land mass, includes Asia, many islands, and so on. And uh, nine of those are endemic to that part of the world. And Australasia has uh, 10 monotypic families, 90% are endemic. And that also makes a lot of sense. That's a fairly isolated area of the world biogeographically. So most of the monotypic families there are endemic. We're gonna start with a really familiar example, the osprey. This is a species most of us uh, will have seen somewhere. It's still uh, very common in the U.S. It has declined in other parts of the world, but it's making a comeback now. This is a species that suffered quite a bit from DDT exposure, but it's common now. And again, the IOC actually splits it into two species, so not monotypic, but Clemens uh, recognizes this as its own family. 
It's related to hawks and eagles, but it's quite different. It has uh, these spiny toe pads and these double jointed toes that help it catch large fish. And this is by far the most widespread monotypic family on the planet. Actually one of the most widespread birds period uh, occurs uh, worldwide except for Antarctica. If you look at, take a look at the range map here, you can see breeds in the Northern hemisphere, winters uh, widely through the Southern hemisphere. And then if you look down in the bottom right hand corner of the map, um, the, the coastal population in Australasia and in Indonesia, that would be considered the Eastern Osprey by the IOC. So if you've been there and you've seen an Osprey, change your classification on eBird, you'll get an extra bird. So we are staying in Australia actually with a bizarre magpie goose, uh, aptly named bird, black and white plumage. And this is most closely related to anhimidae, the South American screamers, and also closely related to ducks and geese, but it is uh, quite unique. It has a strange knob uh, on its head, a pretty strongly hooked bill, and partially webbed toes. It's found in tropical uh, wetlands in Australia and southern New Guinea. Has a really interesting breeding system. It breeds colonially, with uh, most nests are being attended by two females and one male. And it has a 30 day incubation period. And what's really odd for waterfowl is that the chick will hatch one day, um, sorry, it will fledge one day after hatching, but the uh, adults will take care of it for up to a year. And it's uh, vegetarian, you can see one bird there reaching for some plant material. So here's its range. It has declined in southern and eastern Australia, but remains common in northern Australia. So this would be some of the habitat that it occurs in. Uh, this is a photo I took outside of Kakadu National Park in northern Australia. And this species remains quite common there. And it's easy to see, not a, not a secretive bird, uh, quite noisy, occurs in very large flocks occasionally. Also, I took this photo in northern Queensland outside of Cairns. Again, we're showing a little bit of the habitat and behavior. And again, that's also a great place to see it. So for each of these species, I'll mention some of the better spots to see it. So if uh, your family listers out there, um, take notes. So you know where to go to once, once we're back to normal. Now we're jumping right into the most uh, impressive and unique nocturnal bird on the planet, the fascinating oil bird. This is found in Northern South America, and it's uh, most closely related to the neotropical patoos, but it's uh, quite different. It's the only nocturnal fruit-eating bird on the planet, and it roosts and nests in caves. So it's got a couple of really interesting adaptations. It's got a good sense of smell to find fruit. It appears to have some of the most sensitive eyes of any known vertebrate. And in addition, it uses echolocation. It emits these clicks to move around in the complete darkness of caves. So really fascinating species. In addition, the reason it's called oil bird is because they used to collect the chicks and the chicks are fed on uh, palm fruits, which are really uh, high in fat and oils. And they used to boil, boil down the chicks to render them as lamp oil. Fortunately, that practice no longer continues. So they are protected, but that's where the name oil bird actually comes from. And that lovely nest you see, the front bird is that sitting on, it, that is made up of um, fruit pulp, fruit seeds, and feces. So here's its distribution. It has actually been seen in Costa Rica. Uh, not, uh, people aren't entirely sure whether those are birds that may just be wandering or whether there might be an unknown location there for it. Here's another image of uh, one bird on the nest there and another one roosting. Uh, some of you may have traveled to Trinidad. Uh, Aza Wright Nature Center has a colony of them that's accessible. My favorite place to see them is in central Colombia. Uh, there's a, in the Rio Claro area. There's a place that has a lot of limestone canyons and rivers have formed various caves in that area. And you can go to this little ranch and you pay a nominal fee. Uh, I think it's like $2. And you'll walk out on this ranch, you hike up into this limestone canyon, this shallow river uh, through beautiful rainforest. You come around the corner, 
and there's this big opening to the cave and these screeches and screams are coming out of it uh, because these oil birds are really noisy they make some pretty eerie sounds and at first it's a little bit nerve-wracking going in there but you can actually go into the first chamber and see them really well and really close and they're big birds um uh, at least i'd say crow sized at least and as they're fluttering around your head that's uh, quite exciting so we're staying in South America, and the Huatzin is by far the most unique of all the monotypic families, if that's even possible. It is so ancient and so different from other bird species. It's actually not just classified in its own family, but it is its own order. So um, it's completely unresolved what it is actually related to. It is quite unique. It is a folivorous, so it feeds on foliage, on leaves, which is uncommon among birds. And uh, to do that, it has a specialized rumen-like crop that it can digest those leaves. And you'll actually see them sitting around quite a bit, uh, just digesting food, uh, sitting still. And uh, they do, they're a bit of a smelly bird um, because of their digestive system. And some local names and part of their range refer to them as stink birds. They're found through the Amazon basin and uh, the Llanos of Colombia and Venezuela. Truly bizarre species. Uh, can occur in uh, family groups. It's a cooperative breeder with helpers at the nest. Let me show you the range here. Um, luckily, this species remains common. It can tolerate disturbed habitats as long as there's water. It occurs along lagoons, oxbow lakes, uh, slow moving rivers. Uh, this is in the Amazon right here in southern Brazil. And you can see um, it prefers areas where vegetation is overhanging the water for nesting. The chicks have a special adaptation that they fall out of the nest or there's a predator, they'll drop into the water and they can swim. And then they have these rudimentary claws on their wing, which they lose as adults but they can use those claws to climb back through the branches. So quite a, quite a unique species and they're social. So here you can see a group of three sitting, probably digesting. And um, yeah, I think this is probably the closest thing we have to the dinosaur ancestors of birds. I mean, a truly bizarre species. And to give you an idea of size here, I mean, we're talking like a, a guan or a large chicken. Um, it's, it's a sizable bird. And the best place, the most I've ever seen of them uh, was in the Llanos of Colombia, where we had a fence line with 60 of these lined up. Uh, just uh, spectacular large groups there. Here's another monotypic family that uh, some of you will be familiar with, uh, especially if you have done some birding in Florida, the limpkin. Uh, it's named for its unique gait as it walks through uh, wetlands. It looks like it has a bit of a limp. And this species is found from Florida all the way to Argentina. And its range overlaps with that of the apple snail, which is its favorite food. The limpkin actually has an asymmetrical bill with the lower mandible swooped to one side that helps it ex extract these snails from their shells. If you look carefully behind the foot of this one, there is a shell of an apple snail. They also feed on a few other things too. Um, if you've paid close, I'm sure some of you caught this, that this does not look like a limpkin from Florida. Looks quite different. This is the brown-backed subspecies from South America. So it lacks the speckles on the back and on the wing. Uh, quite different looking. So here's its range. It's got a huge range uh, through the West Indies, Mexico. Um, and then, of course, for the ABA area, we have to travel to Florida or to Oklahoma. Interestingly, you know, there was a recent Oklahoma record and for the bird to get there where it was, it either had to violate Arkansas airspace or Texas airspace. So we can add that uh, species retroactively. Here's some classic habitat. Uh, here's one of my groups in a wetland in Florida that limpkins favor in southern Florida. It's not a shy bird. Um, it will call, it makes these shrieking loud calls, which are quite unsettling. It calls off the dark a lot. And if you're not <laughs> expecting it, it can be pretty startling. So this right here is what a limpkin looks like in Florida. You can see a lot of speckles on the back and on the wing. And I didn't even get to mention yet what it is actually related to. 
Um, it looks superficially like an ibis, but it's most closely related to cranes and South American trumpeters. So, and um, really odd ancient lineage. So cranes and trumpeters. And one of the monotypic families we can see in the ABA. So now we're moving really far south to Southern uh, South America, to Patagonia for the strange Magellanic plover. So this is the monotypic family of Patagonia. We're talking far south Chile and far southern Argentina. This is about the size of a ruddy turnstone and it really looks similar to a plover. But amazingly, this bird is most closely related to sheath bills and thick knees. So yeah, this uh, bird taxonomy is quite, uh, quite fascinating. It also feeds differently than a plover. You know how a plover usually runs, stops, runs, stops? The, this guy will move continuously. It will flip some stones and it will even dig uh, into the substrate by spinning in these semicircles. Another cool adaptation that's unique among shorebirds, it has a large crop where it can carry food and regurgitate that to its chicks. So this is really similar to sort of pigeons and doves, like crop milk. And uh, for a while, taxonomists suspected maybe it's related to, to pigeons and doves, but no, it's the sheath bills. Really cool little bird. Um, here's its range. It breeds on playa lakes and uh, lakes and all the way down to Cerro del Fuego, very remote areas. And then during the winter, it moves up to river estuaries on the Argentinian coast. So this is what it looks like. Um, my wife and I, we were down in Cerro del Fuego in the Chilean part of it. And you have these massive playa lakes. And basically the idea is you walk down to the shoreline, you either go right or you go left. You got 50-50, right? And uh, you just walk along the shoreline hoping to bump into one. There's usually a cold, dry wind ripping across this landscape, even in the middle of summer. And uh, not many other birds there. Um, now there are some waterfowl, and then luckily uh, we walked, uh, I don't remember how much we walked, maybe an hour or two, and we bumped into this guy. Quite obvious in this photo, but trust me, they can blend in really well into their environment with that gray back. And we only saw one the entire time we were in Chile. Another um, bird that loves shingle beds, um, the amazing ibis bill. And um, I would say this is the top most wanted bird for anybody going to northern India, Bhutan, or China. It definitely was mine when I got to go to northern India. Looks quite striking in this photo um, with this gray, black, and white plumage. But at a distance, this bird will just disappear. It will blend in and camouflage extremely well. Very, very difficult to spot. It occurs uh, along the shingle bed rivers in Himalaya and in central China. And most of them actually stay at high elevation all year, up to 15,000 feet. It uses that long curved bill to feed around large cobbles, mostly on aquatic insect larvae. So quite a spectacular bird. It's about the size of a long-billed curlew. So, so here's its range. And you can see, fortunately, the sort of light blue area in the southern part of its range so some of them will actually come to lower elevation during the winter months. So this is where I got to see my ibis bill, the only one so far. This is in uh, northern India in the foothills of the Himalayas outside the city of Nanital. And uh, this is a famous wintering site for them. Uh, but, and it took a heroic effort by the co-leader who wandered along the margins of this river until he found one. And this being India, there's lots of stuff along the way you don't want to step into. So I'm forever grateful for, to him for doing that. And we were able to track it down. Here's a slightly better photo showing that coral red bill. And um, I wish, you know, I could uh, have a question answer session now. I would love for you guys to guess what is the closest relative of this one. But it will probably come as a surprise, the oyster catchers. So the closest group of birds related to the ibis bill are the oyster catchers. Really beautiful and bizarre shorebird. Now we're moving continents, Australia. So this is the classic monotypic um, 
bird family of Australia, the Plains Wanderer. And again, this is a taxonomic enigma for a while. It looks a bit like a quail or really similar to a button quail, but amazingly, the closest relatives are the South American seed snipes. So just think about that, South America, Australia. So that lineage uh, probably goes back all the way to Gondwana when those land masses were connected. It's an aptly named bird. It occurs on these plains um, with really short vegetation and it appears and disappears depending on local conditions. Um, let me show you the, this is a male right here. I'll show you a female in a second. Let me show you the range right here. Very fragmented range in New South Wales and Queensland, mostly in the outback. Of all the bird fam monotypic families I'll talk today in detail, this is the most threatened, probably critically endangered. And uh, if you want to see all the bird families on the planet, go soon. Uh, this has an amazing behavior. It is completely cryptic during the day. It will not flush. It will crouch down and run away, essentially impossible to find during the day. And they seem to be a bit crepuscular. So the way you have to find them is you go out with a local guide, Phil Maher, who's been taking people to see this bird for a decade. You drive out into these sheep paddocks at sunset. You wait until dark and you basically start driving in ever increasing circles at ever increasing speed. Uh, with a spotlight until you see one of these guys in the headlights or in the spotlight. And this is about the size of a robin, so it's not a big bird, keep that in mind. But at night, they don't really flush and they, they don't run away, and they're much more out in the open and less cryptic. So this is not the exact habitat, but this is basically what it looks like. It's just mind boggling that that bird cannot be found during daylight uh, ever, essentially. Here's a slightly larger female, a uh, little bit more adorned with that necklace of black and white. And this is a serially polyandrous species. What that translates to is a female will mate with multiple males and the male is left with a parental care. And uh, although the chicks are precocial, the male will defend it for several weeks and the female wanders off, uh, wandering around the plains, finding another male. So that was definitely one of my highlights. We got to go out with Phil Mayer, my wife and I, a couple of years ago, and uh, drove around the paddocks out there in New South Wales, near the town of Deniloquin, and got to see a pair of Plains Wanderers. Uh, probably one of my all-time favorite experiences. Or maybe this is my all-time favorite experience, I don't know, uh, the Kagu. Um, when anybody says monotypic family, I think the Kagu is one of the first things that comes to mind. It's just an exotic species. It's flightless. It has this strange floppy crest that they can raise in a display, these beautiful red legs. And um, it's just unlike any other species on the planet. It's uh, again, um, I would say the size of a, a chicken or the size of an ibis, let's put it that way. Endemic to New Caledonia, uh, which is an island to the east of Australia. And uh, uh, quite a bizarre bird. Uh, Kagu, the name is based on its call, and um, it runs along the ground, stopping and listening for prey and then digging into the mud and leaf litter. Another species that actually breeds cooperatively. And incredibly, the closest relatives of this bird are the atspills, which are an extinct group of birds from New Zealand, and the neotropical sun bittern from Central and South America. So again, you have South America, New Caledonia, New Zealand. So this is another lineage that goes back all the way to Gondwana. So the only living relative of this bird right now is actually the sun bitter. And the kagu also has a pattern on its wing of chest, chestnut and black that it can display. So here's the long island of New Caledonia, and it's got a patchy distribution on the island in some of the wetter forests. And New Caledonia sounds really remote, um, especially for us, it is geographically a long ways away, but it's actually not remote at all. Um, you can get there easily from Australia. Uh, once you have to get to Australia, of course, I understand that, but uh, you can get there from Australia. It's quite modern uh, capital, Noumea. You rent a car, you jump in, you drive to this national park right here, the Blue River National Park. They have a shuttle system, you go in, it will take you five minutes and you see a kagu. 
Um, they even let you camp in this national park, which is what we did. So you can hear them calling at night and you open up your tent in the morning and you'll have a cagoo standing outside your tent. Uh, this one obviously was digging through the leaf litter and through the mud. Just a wonderful bird to see. And uh, New Caledonia is uh, quite, quite well developed, good road system. And this is also a species that was brought back from the brink of extinction. It's much easier to see now. Several decades ago, it was very rare due to habitat destruction and non-native predators. But conservation measures have really helped this bird and the populations are increasing. Um, definitely one of the finest birds on the planet. And here's its close living relative, the neotropical sun bittern. Bit easier to see and to reach than the kagoo. It's got a wide range uh, all the way from Honduras to Brazil and a, a beautiful, stunning uh, bird with a bit of an odd body shape. It's uh, called sun bittern because it has a sunburst pattern on its wings, which are visible in flight. And sometimes it will sort of fan out its wings like this to display. And it also makes a hissing sound like a snake. They occur along rivers, marshes, and lakes uh, throughout Central and South America. Uh, feed on invertebrates and small vertebrates. I often see them hunt butterflies. Uh, they're quite adept at it. They'll run up to an area where butterflies are sitting uh, like a muddy margin of a river and uh, catch one. So here you can see its range, uh, quite widespread. The Pantanal in Brazil, uh, uh, it's very common there, but even in Costa Rica and Honduras, I see them uh, fairly frequently. So here you can see a bit of a habitat shot of one wandering along the edge of a little, this was a little puddle in the Pantanal, and also gives you an idea of this odd body shape and uh, skinny neck and oversized head, um, but just a, just a stunning species. All right, we're jumping continents again. I hope everybody's keeping up. Uh, we're gonna talk about the shoebill. Um, this is uh, one of the most famous bird families in Africa. And again, um, anybody that visits East Africa, this is uh, near the top or probably the top bird they would like to see. Uh, one of the older names uh, refers to it as the whale-headed stork, but it's not a stork at all. It's actually most closely related to the hammercop, which is another monotypic family in Africa. And those two families combined are closely related to pelicanidae, to the pelicans. So you can think of this as an odd, weird, early offshoot of the pelicans. And they do soar sometimes, and they do kind of have a plunge feeding motion. So it's found in East Africa. The highest populations occur in South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan is not the most practical place for a birding tour. So the best and easiest place to see them is in Uganda. In fact, there is a swamp, Mabamba Swamp, about 40 minutes from the international airport in Tebe, and uh, locals will take you out in small rowboats, and they'll take you right up to the shoebill. This is where we saw this one. Uh, so it lives in these big papyrus swamps. It's a sit-and-wait predator, so it just stands there for long periods of time doing nothing, and you can get quite close to it. Um, it's about five feet tall, so it's a sizable bird. Here's its distribution. Um, again, Uganda is the most reliable place to see it. Uh, Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, also not a good place to go birding. So this is uh, what one looks like after it successfully hunted a fish. So this is, um, the bird was just standing there doing nothing and all of a sudden it plunged forward and pulled up this enormous lungfish. I don't wanna exaggerate here, but I think that fish was at least two feet in length. It also hunts frogs and other fish. Yeah, this gives you a better idea of the size of that fish. I mean, half the length of the bird almost. You can see that oversized bill and that um, bizarre eyes. And it took the bird about a minute to swallow that fish whole. So, and then they, they rest and digest and just wait uh, for the next prey item to appear. The other thing that's really neat about them is they can actually uh, use that bill to scoop up water, which they carry back to the nest to douse their young on a hot day. And they're extremely solitary. Even on a nest, a pair will uh, rarely interact. So you see them singly in these big swamps. It is unfortunately threatened by wetland draining. 
And here's its closest relative, the hammer cock. Uh, this one I photographed in uh, Ethiopia, and it is, uh, looks a bit like a heron, but uh, you can see that head shape is very unique. Hammer cock translates as hammer head. It also has this odd laterally compressed bill, and it actually feeds on small fish and tadpole. Um, so it's a, really a bizarre bird. It's widespread throughout uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Madagascar, even into the Middle East. But one of the most unique features about it is it probably builds the largest nest of any bird. I mean, we're talking huge stick nests, these balls of stick nests with an entrance at the bottom that leads to the nesting chamber. They use bones, plastic, and fabrics in, in that stick nest to build them. And a pair will actually construct multiple of these within their territory. Of course, I, I was looking through my collection. I don't have a single picture of a nest, but um, believe me, it's massive. It makes, a, it makes an old bald eagle nest look puny. Uh, they, they build huge nests. So here it's its distribution. Tends to be a common and widespread species um, in uh, wetland areas. So um, easily seen anywhere in uh, Africa. Here's another photo of it. Um, resting, you can't see the hammer-headed shape right there. It's about the size of a night heron. So not, not a huge bird, but um, medium-sized heron. Think of it that way. And then we're moving into some raptors. We are staying in Africa with the incredible secretary bird. This is also classified as monotypic. The name is probably derived from its head plumes, which resemble old riding quills. Kind of hard to see in this bird in flight here. And this occurs in open savanna habitats in sub-Saharan Africa, remains common in protected areas. Um, it's about the, I would say about the size of a great egret. It's a fairly sizable bird as they stride across the savanna. And they feed on large insects, small mammals like hares, and most famously snakes. So they can actually use their long legs to uh, have pretty swift and hard kicks to their prey items, including snakes, and feed on those. They have really thick scales on their legs, which protect them from snake bites. And then these beautiful elongated uh, central tail feathers. And uh, believe me, I went through my entire collection um, before, uh, while putting together this presentation. The only photo I could find of one was this one in flight. I believe I took in Walker Stroom in South Africa. So um, South Africa is a great place to see them, and I've also seen them in southern Ethiopia. Uh, just a magnificent, unique bird, and most closely related, of course, to hawks and eagles and ospreys, but distinct enough to be in its own family. Here's its range uh, throughout sub-Saharan Africa, but it tends to only occur in, in well-protected areas uh, where there's a lot of prey. Now we're moving on into the passerines. So there'll be a couple of really obscure and enigmatic bird families here. Uh, quite a few of them from New Guinea. And I'm um, not sure whether uh, many of you have heard of the wattle plowbill. A small bird about the, a bit smaller than a house sparrow, think of it that way. And it's endemic to New Guinea. It's got these really cool wattles, uh, the males do on either side of the bill and this plow-shaped bill, and they live in a montane forests with a lot of climbing bamboo, and they'll actually dig into bark and moss to feed on insects. It's got a really strange ringing call, uh, this whistle, like many birds in New Guinea, and um, it's restricted to montane uh, forest, so you can see this is the island of New Guinea right here, and only found at higher, higher elevations, basically. So this is the type of forest you would see one in. You can see typically uh, New Guinea, everything is really steep. Um, but it's a, it's a stunning bird, uh, quite mobile, uh, fairly shy, uh, not always easy to see, and uh, pretty difficult to photograph, actually. You can see the male here again with the black breast. And um, we now visit a place called Rondon Ridge Lodge outside of Mount Hagen in central uh, Papua New Guinea where this bird appears to be fairly common and we have excellent chances of seeing it. Uh, really, really neat and always a highlight. Um, look at those big feet, very strong feet, almost like a chickadee. 
Here's another really obscure family from New Guinea, not just by the looks of it, but also it was only recently recognized, the mottled berry hunter. For a while, this was called the mottled whistler because it has this rising whipping song uh, similar to whistlers, but it's now understood to be more closely related to Ioras and boat bills and some other obscure Asian families. It occurs in mid-elevation forests in New Guinea. And uh, this is the female right here. The female is a little bit more ornate with this rusty cheek patch and scaly pattern. The male is more uniform in color. And it's not an easy bird to find. Um, the song gives it away, but it is pretty uh, inconspicuous. And the best way I've found to find it is find a promising fruiting tree and just wait for one to visit. So here's its range, again, uh, pretty much montane does occur in the Fogelkop Peninsula of West Papua. And here's another photo of the same bird. And uh, I think berry hunter is a quite interesting name. I've never seen berries run away or try to get away, um, but this one is keying in on those berries and it's going to hunt them. Um, so yeah, this is another newly recognized family. And um, it's, it's quite interesting. When it was a whistler, it wasn't really on the top of anybody's list. But now that it's a monotypic family, um, we have to see it. And we tend to do quite well uh, in Papua New Guinea getting all the families of, that, of New Guinea on that trip, actually. And I excuse the poor picture. Um, that's the best I could do. This is from many, many years ago. Uh, must be uh, something like eight, nine years ago now, um, before I had uh, decent camera equipment, the Bornean bristlehead. So we are in Borneo now. This is endemic to the island of Borneo. Another spectacularly bizarre bird uh, related to bush shrikes. And it's got this naked yellow head with these spiky yellow bristles, uh, deep red cheeks and, and the rest of the head, jet black plumage. And this oversized bill is for stick insects, cicadas, and katydids. They move around in the canopy, uh, hence the photo. Uh, oh, they're always distant. And um, let me show you. So here it occurs throughout Borneo, although it is threatened uh, by habitat destruction, which is unfortunately rampant in Borneo. And here's what the habitat looks like. So we got to see it. Uh, my wife and I were in Danum Valley which is a protected area of lowland rainforest in Sabah, Borneo, just beautiful, pristine forest. And uh, I must tell you a little story. Here's another distant photo of one in the canopy. They make these weird amphibian guttural calls as they move around in small flocks. And they uh, probably breed cooperatively, although not much is known about them. But this is the best bird I've ever seen from the shower, for sure. So let me explain how. Um, we were camping in Donham Valley, and we had the whole campsite to ourselves because nobody is silly enough to uh, camp in lowland rainforest where it's 200% humidity, 24 hours. But we did, and uh, I was there's an outdoor shower, and I was in the shower uh, washing off the mud and the sweat and the blood from the, there are lots of leeches, so um, my legs were bleeding all over. And as I was rinsing everything off, um, I heard these strange calls and I grabbed my binoculars nearby, ran over to the forest edge, and there's a group of these guys moving through. And that was the only Bornean bristlehead we saw the entire uh, two weeks in Borneo. So not an easy bird to find. And by the way, the leeches were worth it. Uh, there were lots of pittas to be stalked. Back to New Guinea, the blue cap Ephrata. This is a really fascinating species for several reasons. Uh, again, this is um, part of the Covoide radiation from Austral Asia. Um, nobody really knows what it's closely related to. It's just an ancient lineage uh, kind of by itself. And it moves like a nuthatch along tree trunks and uh, branches. Occurs uh, again in a mountain forest with lots of moss. And what's really interesting about this bird is it's one of the poisonous or toxic birds found in New Guinea. So it will actually eat specific beetles and it will sequester a chemical into its plumage and into its skin, which makes it toxic. It's the same type of chemical you find in uh, neotropical poison dart frogs. 
So there are a handful of species in New Guinea that have uh, toxic plumage, essentially. And uh, it probably protects the birds from predators, uh, but no, no research has been done. All, all we know is that it has that toxins in its skin and plumage. And this one is a quite easy uh, one to see in Papua New Guinea. Uh, there's a lodge, Kumua Lodge, where they come visit the gardens regularly. And uh, yeah, basically like a, uh, like a nuthatch. So again, here's that montane distribution throughout New Guinea. And here's just a photo of the uh, montane forest in New Guinea. You see uh, laden with epiphytes, um, lots of moss, usually drenched in fog and drizzle and shy birds. So some of the best birding on the planet. This one was a huge bonus, uh, the bearded reedling. Um, I didn't expect that to see anytime soon. Um, another really bizarre bird. Um, it has confused taxonomists for a while. It was at one point cl uh, classified with paridae. So those are the chickadees and titmice. Um, then it was classified maybe as a strange uh, babbler. And um, yeah, listen up, now it is understood to be sister or closely related to the larks. So how that works, who knows, but that's what the genetics uh, tell us. So, but it's of course now classified in its own family. And it occurs in phragmite reed beds from uh, Europe into Central Asia. And it has a really interesting seasonal diet. So during the summer, they will feed on insects. And during the winter, they switch completely to reed seeds. And to accommodate that seasonal change, their digestive system, the morphology of their digestive system changes seasonally, the stomach lining and everything. So just a bizarre species, uh, can be tricky to see. It lives in these dense reed beds, but it's quite vocal. They're not always out in the open like that. Um, let me tell you the story really quick. I got to see, you can see if you look at Europe there on the left, it's got a very scattered distribution there, restricted to wetlands, and then widely distributed in Asia. And I got to see it if my cursor shows up right here at the very edge of its range in the Qinghai province of China. We were birding on Qinghai Lake, and there was a reed bed, and it must have been 10 by 20 feet. It was tiny. And there was a pair of bearded reedlings in there that I did not expect. And we were able to coax it out uh, into view. And you can see the plumes on its face are much more like a mustache uh, versus a beard. It's actually a plume that really sticks down off its cheek, uh, down from the eye on the male. So another really fascinating monotypic uh, group right here. So back to South America with the black Keptonacobius. Uh, another confusing species, it was thought to be a wren, then it was thought to be a strange mimic, like a, uh, uh, like a mockingbird. It's now in its own family. Its closest relatives are the Malagasy warblers from Madagascar and the grass birds from the Old World. Confusing. And uh, it basically is an Old World lineage found in South America. It's widely distributed in tropical and subtropical wetlands, can be quite common in the right habitat even spills a little bit into eastern Panama. So here's a pair. Uh, this also breeds cooperatively, and they have this fascinating display where their body kind of whips up and down as they're calling, their tail is fanned and swinging left and right. And you can see on the top bird a little bit of orange. That's an orange air sac that inflates as they're calling. So really bizarre. Not entirely sure why anybody ever thought this was a wren, but that's what it was classified as. And now another monotypic family. And uh, quite easy to see in various wetlands in Brazil, Colombia. The wall creeper, uh, another uh, bird that many people would love to see. This is found in alpine areas in Europe and into Asia. Looks quite plain here, quite gray, but it has a beautiful red pattern on its wing. Looks a bit like a butterfly when it flies, when it opens those wings. Also feeds on cliffs and also on the ground. I photographed this one along the Annapurna circuit in Nepal, where it was feeding along the edge of a river. So here you can see its range, again, quite spotty in Europe, and then solid uh, in the Himalayas. Goes to pretty high elevations to 12,000 feet. So for example, I took this one along the Annapurna circuit in Nepal, 
Um, not classic wall creeper habitat, but there was one up there, so can tolerate pretty high elevations. They feed on uh, small insects, spiders, and even small mollusks. And another really interesting thing is uh, during the winter, they'll move to lower elevation. And they've been known to winter on the rock facades of cathedrals in Europe. So if you imagine one of these really old, massive cathedrals, every once in a while, a wall creeper will set up shop for the winter and stay there. I guess it mimics their natural habitat just enough. The palm chat, this is a North American endemic family, endemic to the island of Hispaniola. Looks like a strange tanager, but it actually is related to waxwings. So this is another one of these bizarre waxwing lineages, uh, probably a very ancient surviving lineage on Hispaniola. So Hispaniola is made up of the Dominican Republic and of Haiti. It's an easy bird to see there in the Dominican Republic, tolerates disturbed habitat very well, will nest in the middle of towns and villages. Here's a huge stick nest. They build these communal nests at the base of palm trees with a four to 10 pairs using the nest. So really gregarious and noisy. You can see some sitting on their stick nest here. They're actually five birds in this photo. So um, probably one of the birds, first birds you might see if you go on a birding trip to the Dominican Republic, the palm chat. And we're getting, uh, I got two more families in detail here. This is another uh, one that really vexed and confused taxonomists for a long time, the Privalski's pinktail, which is endemic to alpine scrub of China. Uh, to give you some examples here, one of the older names was pinktail bunting. Uh, look at the bill, kind of bunting-like. It's not a bunting at all. The internal structure of the bill is different. Uh, it was called the Pravalski's rose finch, not a finch at all. The tail is too skinny and too long. And now it's understood to be a monotypic family, of course. And it's most closely allied to wax bills, uh, New World warblers, and tanagers. Um, it also has an odd number of primaries, just a very strange bird. Uh, quite shy uh, when they're feeding, but in, when the males are singing, they'll sit up like that. You can see um, distribution centered there in central China, Tibetan Plateau, and some of the mountains. And this was one of my, uh, probably my, on my most favorite birding morning ever. I really wanted to see this bird, and we were in Qinghai in the rubber mountains, and we walked across this Tibetan grassland there, you can see some of the shrubby vegetation ahead of us, and that's what they prefer. The sun was rising behind us, and I think the second bird in the scope that morning was a beautiful Prowalski's pink tail. And you can see a very long skinny tail right there. And they feed mainly on fruits and flowers, actually. And uh, this used to be quite a tricky family to see, but, um, it's become easier as uh, local birders understand its whereabouts better. And for the last one I'll talk about in detail, we'll come full circle, we'll come home. Uh, of course, this is found through, throughout Arkansas, very widespread species in the U.S. Um, I even had some setting up territories a few miles down the road from me here in Iowa, the yellow-breasted chat. Uh, long thought to be a strange warbler. If you've ever seen one in the field, you know it's not a warbler. Uh, huge bill, big sized bird, moves around dense vegetation, has this bizarre butterfly like display flight where it goes up and flutters really slowly, giving these odd chuckling calls. So the yellow breasted chat is another monotypic family that we have in the US. Here's its range, really widespread throughout um, North America. So I want to, um, for the sake of time, I'll leave this slide up in a second here. Those are the other monotypic families. I won't go into too much detail, but if anybody has questions about them in a minute, I can explain a bit further. One thing I wanted to do really quick was a bit, a, bit of a look into the future. Here's another strange uh, group of birds from New Guinea, the Lesser Melampida. It's a, bit, a little bit like a tiny ant pitta running around on the ground. And there's also a greater melampida, uh, which is impossible to find, essentially. Currently, they're in the same family, but they will probably be split. So the lesser melampida, which is relatively gettable in New Guinea, will be its own family. And the greater melampida 
will instantly become the most difficult bird family to see on the planet. So if you have aims to see all the bird families on the planet, keep your fingers crossed that they don't split the melampita. Um, go online and try to find a picture of a greater melampita. There are two photos of that bird ever taken. The greater melampita will actually hide in sinkholes in karst limestone mountains. It's a, it's a truly another bizarre bird. So before I go back to that slide, I just want to say thank you. Here are a couple of Watsons um, from Colombia, one of the big flocks. But I uh, appreciate your time and I'm really happy you guys were able to join me and I hope you learned something and enjoyed this quick journey around the world. I'll go back to this slide right here, listing the other 15 monotypic families I didn't talk about in detail. So if you guys have any questions about those, go ahead. Otherwise, uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Stefan. That was fascinating, I thought. Uh, see, Thank Dan you. Has, Dan has a question. Um, if you had to pick your favorite monotypic family, which one would it be? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I, I have actually, I've seen 36 of the 38. So um, I've seen almost all of them. I haven't seen the cuckoo roller and I haven't seen the strange Hylocetrea. So, you know, I would like to see both of those. So it would be either one of those. But uh, the ones I've seen, I'd probably say the Prabalski's uh, pingtail. It was just such a magical experience in the Tibetan plateau uh, with that bird that was really, um, really unforgettable. So for now, it's that. Ask me next week, it'll be something different. <laughs> Okay. I was actually about to ask which ones you haven't seen too, so you <laughs> answered that. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Jack says, the only trouble with this presentation, it makes me want to pack my suitcase with masks and go now. I, I, I'm with you. <laughs> yes, that's true. Does anyone else have any questions for Stefan? Let's see. Uh, Dan says taxonomy has changed so much since he learned it in ornithology in 1996. Definitely has. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there uh, there's a lot more splitting going on, and um, you know, as we get more detailed genetic information, for example, the spotted elatura surprised everybody. I think um, that was such a that's such a strange bird to be a waxwing. Um, I don't have a photo here. I have seen it, but it's it's a very skulky bird. Uh, it's uh, found in China. But I mean, think about it. It looks like a little spotted winter wren, uh, very skulky. And you know, to think that it's related to to wax wings and the palm chat and silky flycatchers and phenopeplas, it's just um, just incredible. Same with some of these strange West Indian lineages, like the Puerto Rican tanager. Uh, Cuban warblers and so on. These are all in their own families now. Very strange groups too. Yeah. Uh, Dan had another question. How many bird families have you seen? Um, I think it's uh, up to 240 or 241. I think I'm missing eight or seven. Um, most of these uh, that I'm missing, uh, I've never been to Madagascar. So there, that would be a big haul. And then um, I need to, the Hylocitrea, which is uh, at the bottom of the page there. That's another weird waxwing lineage, again, uh, thought to be a whistler. And that's endemic to Sulawesi. I have not been to Sulawesi. And then there's one more, I need to go to Cuba, because the Cuban warblers. And then there's one more strange family in Africa called the dapple throats, which uh, you have to go to Tanzania or Kenya to see that. So. Um, like I said, uh, I agree. I want to pack up my, my suitcases too and, and head on out. Definitely. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Jack wants to know if you've run into, oh my goodness, uh, I don't know if I can pronounce this right, uh, uh, Oi Chin Hawk in Malaysia. We found Borneo bristle thigh. Sorry. Sorry. Um, 
Can you repeat that? I'm not sure. Um, have you run into O O I C H I N H O C K in Malaysia? No, I don't. Um, not sure what what that refers to. To be honest, Jack, you want to uh, clarify a little, or I would. Uh, I would hazard a guess. You're probably not. I went to Malaysia many many years ago. Um, Oh, he, he says it's a human being birder. Okay. Okay. No, I definitely, yeah, I definitely have not. No, and if I did, I wouldn't remember. I think I um, uh, went to Malaysia maybe 10 years ago or something like that. Okay. Where that's the home of the rail babbler family. That's another fantastic monotypic family that we got to see there. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Stefan, that was a wonderful presentation. We are very appreciative you took the time to talk to us tonight and, uh, and I really enjoyed it. I'm glad you did. I hope everybody else did. And uh, thanks again for hosting me. And um, yeah, if you got any more questions, just shoot them to Dan, I guess, and you can pass them on to me and we'll, we'll go from there. Sounds good. Thank you guys. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, guys, uh, it is just a little after t eight. Um, we're going to take a short break, you know, stretch our legs a little bit, and be back here, let's say, about 8.15. Um, I do have a question for everybody real quick, though. Uh, I only got eight responses on the um, Google form for the competition. So if you think that you had trouble putting in your responses to the Google form. If you think you, you didn't get your responses in, please let me know and I will try to do something different. I'll, I'll send another one out or and we'll get that, that fixed if we can, okay? Okay, so let's, uh, let's meet back about 8.15.